In part one, we mentioned how strange humans are in so many ways relative to most other species. Now we'll look at the curious human phenomenon of walking on two legs and see how this has benefited us. The fancy name for this is bipedalism. All the great apes, that's chimpanzees, gorillas and bonobos, can walk on two legs, but only humans do it all the time. This facility arrived at least four million years ago, probably in the early human line of Australopithecus. Obviously birds developed this ability long ago, as did some marsupials and rodents. Human bipedalism is pretty unique, however, because these other animals also tend to keep their backbones horizontal to the ground, especially in motion, and many have tails to improve their balance. Humans, however, have an upright posture all the time and lost their tails maybe 15 million years ago. But scientists aren't exactly sure, did humans start to walk and leave their cousins behind? Or did all great apes originally move on two legs, but some take to life in the forests and then begin to lose their ability to walk? It's an interesting question. If you see a human being on all fours, you are immediately aware of how small they look, no bigger than a fair-sized dog. But stand them up and they look much bigger, very handy if you're face to face with a predator. Add lots of hair and noise and waving sticks and you've got a pretty neat illusion of size and intimidation. Walking leaves the hands and arms free to carry babies, wield weapons and gather food. Standing upright also helps to keep cool in the sun, helps to look further afield for prey and predators, and makes wading into water looking for food easier. But moving on two feet is also very efficient. A human on two legs uses a quarter of the energy of an ape on four, and can easily outrun a horse or a deer by sheer stamina alone. As climate change caused the forests to disappear, a bipedal human hunting pack could chase a prey animal for miles through the new grasslands until it was exhausted, then kill it and carry the carcass back to the family group. In fact, walking on two legs is so useful it's a wonder more species haven't adapted to it. Actually, to a degree they did. Archaeologists have been driven crazy over the last hundred years with the numerous different hominid fossils and bones trying to put together a huge jigsaw of which species are related to which, and they're still finding them. The latest occurred in 2003 when the remains of a three foot tall adult of a hitherto unknown hominid species were found on the island of Flores in Indonesia. Running is a sophisticated form of motion. Other apes can walk, but they can't run well. But human running is even more specialised because unlike most mammals, a human is limited to using just one leg at a time for propulsion. On each step the whole body weight has to be borne by one leg and foot, and there's no tail to keep balance. The human foot is connected to the leg with a spring-loaded ankle joint to extend the stride and push forward. It also has a sprung arch to relieve the shock when the whole weight of the body passes through the ball of the foot as it hits the ground. In place of a tail, humans have hips which are flexible and allow the arms and trunk to swing to keep balance. And a flexible neck which keeps the head and eyes steady while running hard or looking around. And while all this is going on, the ability to carry and use a weapon and communicate with others. So what has bipedalism done for you? Well, it's given you nice long legs for a start. This means you can walk further faster. On the other hand, it's also given you huge feet to take the weight of your whole body and provide balance as you move from one foot to the other when you walk. But you also have flexible ankles and strong tendons to help you move easily and add another few inches to your leg length when you run for the last bus. And since you no longer need to grip with your feet, you now have small dainty toes. You've got big knees and strong hip joints. Unlike apes who walk bow-legged, you are not kneed. Now this might sound unflattering, but it's good. It means your thigh bones are angled inwards to your knees 
helping support your body from directly underneath. Good for standing for hours in the rush hour and at parties. And if you thought your bottom or gluteus maximus evolved to sit on, then you'd be wrong. It's there to help you keep upright and for standing on one leg as you move. Unlike most other animals, whose heads are cantilevered horizontally from the shoulders so they can see ahead, you can stand upright looking forward with your skull balanced on top of your spine. This upright posture has probably helped your brain get larger since its increasing weight would be borne straight down through the body. So walking on two legs has helped you with your exams and all those smartphone apps. The same process has also allowed your neck to become long and more flexible. Being able to move your neck easily means you can follow tennis matches and it stops your head wobbling around when you run. But not needing your arms and shoulders for motion anymore means your larynx has been able to move down into your throat so now you can talk and sing even while you're walking. And since you no longer need strong facial muscles to hold your head up, this means that you can now use the same muscles to let people know how you feel. But, as they say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Changing posture so all your weight goes vertically down through your skeleton has caused problems. Instead of being straight, your backbone has to be curved in a slight S shape to stop you leaning forward from your hips and to support the weight of a pregnant mother's stomach. This leads to the pains in the lower back so many of us are familiar with. And despite your knee and hip joints being big and strong, they can still suffer from wear and tear leading to arthritis, something even our ancient ancestors suffered from. But probably the biggest problem involves childbirth. Because the female pelvis cannot cope with walking efficiently and giving birth to a well-developed baby, particularly one which now has a much bigger head, evolution has come up with a compromise. The pelvis is kept relatively small and babies are born much earlier and therefore smaller than they should ideally be. This is why human babies are so helpless in their first year or so and need so much care. But despite these problems, clearly the success of the newest version of the human species over the last 200,000 years shows this compromise has worked pretty well.